Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Salvatore Pinizzotto. I am the Secretary General at the International Arab uh, Study Group, and uh, uh, I would uh, really welcome you at this uh, event that uh, ISG has organized together with uh, C4FTA and uh, the International um, Rubber Research and Development uh, Board. Uh, we are going to have uh, one hour and a half to spend together um, during this event, and uh, uh, we are going to have a lot of speakers, so uh, without uh, any doubt, I would like to invite uh, uh, Robert Nasi, Director General of uh, C4, for a welcome address. Rob. Uh, good morning, uh, good uh, evening, uh, good afternoon to everybody and um, for the people here in, in Seoul and mostly also for the, the, the people online. Uh, I'm particularly happy to, to welcome you to this event, um, which is co-organized by the International Rubber Study Group, the International Rubber Research and Development Board, and c 4 ecraf on uh, promoting green economic growth in natural rubber system and beyond. Uh, so why, why is it important to, to discuss about that? I mean, first about, we are in a sort of a very traditional forestry forum, I mean, it's sort of, uh, here, here in, in Seoul, uh, you are forester talking to forester. Uh, and, and I think it's, I remember a, a comment by your colleague, the minister of, out of the, the four big commodities, the one that is closest to a forest is rubber. Uh, all palm is not a tree and cocoa and coffee, it's a bit different. So, and, and, and rubber is originally a non-timber forest product that were harvested in, in the natural forest uh, in, in Amazonia. And it also a different uh, uh, characteristic compared to, to many of the, the other large commodity. 85% is produced by uh, small holders in, in six countries. 95% of the rubber is probably produced in this five country. And, and so rubber is a tree, it produces, uh, uh, rubber tree is a tree, it produces rubber and it produces timber also. And, and so the, the, there is a potential for uh, for rubber to, to play a role uh, in terms of adaptation and mitigation of climate change, uh, producing renewable material, rubber and wood, and, and also uh, having an importance in the economy and the livelihood of, of many people, of millions of, of smallholder. And this is something that is not, not really uh, properly accounted for. And, and I think it, it, it's a bit of a pity because uh, it, it will be very important and, and interesting. And it, it will allow us to, to look at uh, uh, trees being uh, more than simply uh, sticks of carbon. And if we want to transition to a, a bioeconomy, that means replacing a fossil fuel based product by a bio based product. I mean, a sort of, uh, you all know that we have a natural rubber and synthetic rubber. I mean, a sort of, I have specialists here, but I think that the natural rubber is something like 45% of the, of the consumption. Uh, and, and, and I think that there is a role for more natural rubber produced by a tree as a renewable material uh, compared to a synthetic rubber produced uh, from uh, fossil fuel as a non-renewable. And we all know that fossil fuel, they are better in the ground than in the air. And, and third, uh, for people will look at it, I mean, a sort of, there is an impressive array of people in the room and, and online uh, that will explain us uh, how, how we can move into a, a sustainable rubber. This is not to say that there is no problem with rubber. We move from 5 million hectares to more than 11 million hectares in 10 years. Uh, in some places, I mean, some forests have been cut to put rubber, but ultimately I think that rubber is one of the commodities that has a potential to be sustainable. Uh, but I think there's also a commodity that is missing some sort of uh, overarching uh, um, certification or sustainability standard that, that something that will allow uh, maybe like the RSPO or something better for rubber that, that will allow to have a sustainable rubber brand uh, delivered to the market and, and, and getting. So a lot of potential uh, and I'm very pleased to, to have this here and uh, I will stop and really listen to the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, uh, for this introduction. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Abdul Aziz, Secretary General IRDB, uh, to give a welcome address. Dr. Aziz. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First, on behalf of the uh, board and directors of the RDB member institutes, some 22 member countries, I would like to ex express our appreciation and thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to highlight the important role of the smallholders in ensuring the success of the green economy for natural rubber now and into the future. The most important role of the smallholders is to continue producing rubber. Even though the last decade has been very challenging, not to talk about the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the climate change situations where you know, unpredictable weather events affected the productivity of the rubber small holdings. So it is important that the smallholders be rewarded. There should be a remunerative price for them to continue producing their rubber. Although, if we look at the last decade, price has not been very good, very low price. But the smallholders continue to produce this important industrial raw material. So what is important now with the climate change uh, incidents, uh, increasing incidence of important diseases, especially the latest that we have now is pestalotiopsis, uh, important leaf disease that's causing a decrease in productivity at least to about 20% in many countries now, from Malaysia, Indonesia, is also in Sri Lanka, Thailand. And then uh, the, what we need to highlight now, the focus of the RDB is to continue the research and development activities. Most important is breeding for high yield latex, high yield wood and disease resistant clones of rubber, which through the RDB now we are making exchanges, free exchange of rubber clones to all the RDB member countries involving some 49 clones. So what we, I would like to highlight here is the RDB will continue to focus on, RD, on the focus uh, on our, the research uh, priority areas, such as breeding, uh, rubber modification, uh, rubber technology, because natural rubber is utilized in some 40,000 over products. And there are millions of smallholders, more than 40 to 50 million of smallholders and their families who are dependent on this crop. So it is important that both the consumers and those that who are actually um, projecting the important role of planting rubber in terms of uh, mitigation of the climate change, that smallholders should be given remunerative price. They have continued to produce, even though the price has not been remunerative. So now it is time to ensure the success of the green economy now into the future, especially when we are talking about the problem with the uh, fossil fuel and all these things. So there is expected to be increasing demand for this important industrial raw material. We should look after the interests of the smallholders who are the predominant, predominant producers of this uh, commodity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zitz, uh, for this introduction. Now it's uh, the time for the uh, first presentation. Um, we are, I'm glad to introduce uh, Dr. Raghavan, that is the Executive Director of the Rubber Board of India, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. He's also a chairperson of the International Rubber Study Group. So Dr. Raghavan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salvatore. Uh, good morning to all of you. Good afternoon uh, to those of you across the noon time. Uh, I'll introduce myself. I am Dr. Raghavan. I'm uh, Executive Director of Rubber Board of India. And uh, I brought a small presentation with me, which uh, I'll be sharing with you. So I'll go through the presentation and probably after that we can have a QA and a session. Two interesting points were raised uh, during the introductions by Mr. Robert and Dr. Assis. Mr. Robert pointed out that rubber is closest to the forest. And Dr. Assis mentioned about the need for having a remunerative price, both of which are very important aspects when you look at the picture of climate change and sustainability. So I'll come to the presentation proper. Climate change mitigation is basically the sum total of actions taken to minimize the intensity of climate change and to protect global ecosystems. So sustainability is one particular and important component of this 
in as much as what is sustainability sustainability essentially means what do we leave to the future generation is it something better that what we inherited or something worse of that that and what will be the role of natural rubber in that coming to the indian scenario we have around uh, 827000 hectares of planted area the tappable area is roughly around 700000 hectares and uh, it is a small holders crop world over if uh, 85% of the holdings are with small holders in india 91% of the holdings are with small holders and the average size of the holdings is 0.57 hectares i also like to say that in india the rubber that is produced about 75 to 80% of the rubber that is produced is in the sheet rubber form so basically the small holders uh, have the farms in which they get the latex and they convert the latex into rubber sheets either through a homestead approach or to a collective where the processing takes place so all these activities take place with a minimal in the, uh, amount of uh, machinery and its minimal interference with the nature uh, we have in india a rubber research institute of india which is uh, working with the rubber board and that is headquartered at kottayam this institute has been this research institute has been functioning from 1955 i have with me dr jessi who is a director of the institute and they have been doing lot of research and studies into various aspects of the rubber plantations they have developed clones they have developed genetically modified rubber and there is a division there which looks at the impact of climate change also so whatever are the uh, presentation findings in the presentations are essentially the findings of the studies and research which is done by the rri now first is the carbon sequestration potential of nr so we have studied this uh, using the eddy covariance technique by measuring the canopy level carbon dioxide flux so and estimated that the mean net ecosystem exchange is determined as 32 metric tons carbon dioxide per hectare per year now this is what we have found out through our studies here so roughly if you look at it the nr plantation in, in india release around 11.6 million tons of oxygen every year and sequesters around 16 million tons of carbon dioxide every year so these are the broad figures these plantations actually take in carbon uh, dioxide and release oxygen in the quantities that are mentioned here on the screen more importantly we have a comparison between nr and sr we all know that uh, nr is a natural product sr is synthetic but let us look at the quantum of uh, nr the uh, carbon dioxide that nr sequesters and the quantum of uh, uh, carbon dioxide that sr releases now for producing 1 ton of nr sequestration is almost 10 metric tons of carbon dioxide while while you produce 1 ton of sr synthetic rubber it is a release of 10 to 15 tons of carbon dioxide so that is a comparison so we need to produce if you want to have a sustainable environment if you want to mitigate the impact of this is what i am explaining the comparison between the production of nr and the production of sr and while nr produces or, or uh, one metric ton of production of nr results in sequestering of around 10 metric tons of carbon dioxide production of one metric ton of sr results in release of 10 to 15 metric tons of carbon dioxide so if you want a cleaner environment if you want a more sustainable future if you want to mitigate the impact of climate change well we will have to minimize the production of uh, synthetic rubber and maximize the production of natural rubber next slide please can you see this i hope you can next slide can you see the next slide no Organic. we're still on we're still on slide number 3 you should move to slide number 4 some some One second. Let me just reload it. Can you just reload the? Okay. Now it's four. Now it's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is organic carbon in soil. We have done yes. about the uh, how how the rubber plantations impact the organic carbon content of the soil and found that actually the organic carbon content improves due to the leaf litter addition. And our studies show that around there's ten to twenty percent increase in the organic carbon content of the soil over a planting time, which will take us about thirty years. Next. and this is a water use efficiency of rubber trees uh, this is significant uh, so far as the water mining rate which we studied using the sap flow system this is a real time study and not based on uh, estimates or uh, any thing the real time study in which the, uh, we fit the instrument concerned onto the trunk of the rubber tree and uh, measure the water mining rate we have compared it with the other crops that is grown in the main uh, rubber growing area in india which is kerala the southern state of uh, the country so the alternate crops that are grown one is coconut which is uh, quite uh, um, uh, broadly cultivated in the state and the other two eucasia and eucalyptus are what are grown through the social forestry uh, department 
So we find that actually the water mining efficiency of rubber is much higher when compared to coconut, acacia, and eucalyptus. For rubber, it is only about 20 to 25 kg of water per tree per day, whereas for coconut and acacia and eucalyptus, it's much more. So the water use efficiency is also higher as far so far as rubber trees are concerned. Next. Carbon footprint of rubber plantation. Again, what will be the total carbon emission from a rubber plant, a rubber farm? Uh, and from the processing units, because as I said, in India, the processing is from latex to sheet rubber. Very little of the uh, block rubber is made from the couplums. So what we found is that during the life cycle, 27 metric tons of carbon dioxide is emitted from a rubber farm. When you compare it with uh, 32 metric tons per year, which is sequestered, the emission is very small. And the emission from processing units, which basically converts the uh, latex into sheet, is only 25 metric tons per hectare per cycle. And this low emission is due to very low fertilizer requirement. Actually, in the India, the rubber plantation is very low fertilizer requirement because rubber is planted only in soil which is favorable for the cultivation. And the other planting and agriculture practices are not a big source of greenhouse uh, gases emission. Next. Biodiversity. Initially, uh, NR was uh, recommended as a monoculture crop. So we did not uh, recommend planting of other, other trees or uh, crops in uh, rub, uh, rubber plantations. But now intercropping has, uh, has been recommended for two reasons. One, to promote biodiversity. Second, it promotes an alternate source of revenue also. Because the cyclical pattern of the rubber prices where you have a high for a decade followed by a low during the next decade, the farmer needs to have some cushioning against the vagaries of the fluctuating prices. So we are recom uh, uh, recommended intercromic with medicinal plants, food crops, fruits. Common ones are pineapple, uh, we are recommended cocoa, we are recommended coffee. And medicinal plants are a good source of uh, revenue also for the farmer. So these are NR-based uh, homestead farming systems. And it improves the biodiversity and improves the soil health. And that again contributes to mitigating the climate change impact. Next. Soil health. Uh, there is minimum tillage of the soil while planting uh, rubber sapling. No, normally it is done by manual labor. Occasionally we use uh, machines also, but mostly it is still done because the small holders crop, they cannot afford machines is one reason. Second for them, that's when they uh, do the uh, pitting and others by themselves, the conservation of soil also is uh, ensured. And it sustains the soil health because less fertilizers are also used. As I mentioned, in India, the use of fertilizers for rubber planters is minimal. These are the advantages, whatever I said now. Substantive carbon sequestration, sustaining soil health, low inputs, uh, better water use efficiency, supports bio biodiversity, and less carbon footprint. Now, so far as India is concerned, we meet the sustainable development goals because uh, you know, we don't uh, cut down forests and plant rubber. Rubber is planted in area where the replacement is normally with, like, like I said, in Kerala, coconut trees have been replaced by uh, rubber. Bamboo has been replaced by rubber. We don't cut down forests and uh, grow rubber plantation. We don't have use of child labor in any other plantation in the, uh, in the country. We follow the good agriculture practices which are recommended. Some of them I can list out. One is rain guarding. We have popularized rain guarding because at least four to five months we have monsoons, particularly in the rubber growing areas in, Kerala, in the South India. Second, we have recommended low uh, frequency tapping system, which means that the farmer needs to tap only once a week and the quantum of latex produced is uh, almost the same if you do that. So low uh, frequency tapping has been recommended. Self-tapping has been uh, recommended. We give some financial incentive for people who uh, do self-tapping and low frequency tapping. We are looking at inclusive growth and social security. Now, rubber has played a big role in actually rehabilitating the tribal plantations. They used to, in the northeastern state of Tripura, there was a practice of Jum, in which uh, uh, people used to, it, it was a moving tribal settlement. They used to settle down one area, burn the forest, live there for some time, then move to other area. So it created, ha played havoc with the environment. But after the rubber plantations were introduced in Tripura, they all settled down. And that is not only helped them financially and helped them move up the social ladder, but also helped to conserve the environment in that part. So it is used for uh, as... Uh, a social security uh, measure and also for promoting inclusive growth in the country. Next. The way forward. Now, uh, the advantages of rubber as a green
green crop has not been properly acknowledged as such. This is the sad truth because rubber ultimately is the industrial raw material. So the green credentials are not always identified. Now, we, not many people know about the uh, advantages of natural rubber besides the synthetic rubber, how, how it impacts the environment, what is the advantage, how, how much carbon dioxide is sequestered when uh, natural rubber is produced, how much carbon dioxide is released when uh, synthetic rubber is produced. This has not been understood properly. Second, uh, we need to, uh, uh, if you're working towards reducing the carbon footprint, we need to promote natural rubber. And it can be used. Now, we, are, we should not be growing this purely as a crop for the producing industrial raw material. It should be part of the reforestation programs, the greening programs, rejuvenation program. Now, we have river rejuvenation programs. We can have rubber planted there. There's soil conservation happening there. Any other rejuvenation programs that happens, we can actually use rubber. Social forestry, instead of planting acacia and eucalyptus, as we've done in the past, we are recommending that natural rubber should be planted. So if you bring in a lot of these uh, policy interventions into the book, then there is much better scope for increasing the area under cultivation. The bottom line ultimately is that the farmer should get a remunerative price. This is where the government intervention is also required. When the prices fall below a certain level, the farmer finds it unremunerative to produce rubber. So we had a situation uh, in India where a lot of farms were left untapped. So uh, Kerala, uh, one of the state governments had introduced a policy for providing incentive for rubber production. And then we, from the rubber board side, had adopted a policy of adopting farms which are left untapped so that we could continue to produce rubber from them so that it did not lie idle. So these sort of policy interventions are also required if you have to sustain rubber plantations and make it a viable alternative for uh, greening up of the country and of the world. So this is a brief presentation from my side. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. I'll be ready to take questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raghavan, for this interesting presentation. You point out a uh, few important uh, uh, elements in there. And uh, also, you introduced uh, a topic that is uh, uh, climate change and uh, natural rubber systems and uh, how they uh, interact. And I think uh, the second presentation of uh, Thierry Serres, uh, Chief Technical Officer, Natural Rubber of Michelin, uh, will present uh, an industry perspective uh, also on this uh, topic. Thierry? Yeah, good day, everyone. Um, thank you very much for hosting me at uh, the WFC. Um, hopefully you can see my screen and uh, please confirm slides are, are, are moving uh, uh, correctly. So um, thank you, uh, Salvatore. Uh, my name is Thierry Ser, as you said, I'm the Chief Technical Officer at Michelin, and my presentation will be about um, um, climate change resilience and um, mitigation indeed. Is it okay for the slides? Uh, we can see it, yes. Okay, very good. Um, well, so starting with um, a, a few important background information, um, well, you, you, you might be knowing, but uh, we have about uh, 6 billion rubber trees planted on Earth, so almost as many rubber trees as human beings. Uh, on this planet. And uh, as previously said, it is a, uh, an absolute key material for the tire industry, which accounts for 75% of uh, the natural rubber consumption, but also for numerous applications. So we have thousands of applications uh, using natural rubber. Um, there will be, and there is already, a growing demand for sustainable raw materials. And as an example, uh, I just give you uh, an example of what is Michelin commitment in terms of a sustainable material rate in our tires. So in 2021, let's say today, we have about 29% uh, of sustainable uh, raw materials um, in tires and mostly natural rubber with a commitment of growing to 40% by 2030 and 100% by calendar year 2050 and all tire makers are making similar commitment. Um, and at the same time, uh, they are all racing, we are all racing to net zero as said before. And as Dr. Aziz said uh, in his uh, initial words, um, global warming will impact um, the rubber industry. And that's why resilience to climate change and mitigation, mitigating climate change impact is so important. So moving to our uh, next uh, slide, 
I would like to, um, to show you uh, how climate change could impact um, uh, the yields and what we call uh, the viable marginal zones for rubber cultivation. So we did an exercise uh, combining the IPCC model. Uh, you all know about uh, the five scenarios just released by the IPCC um, and crossing that or combining that with a rubber model, which has been developed by, uh, by the, the, the teams of CIRAD and particularly Dr. Goe in a publication made in 2015. So that rubber model will uh, uh, key in different parameters like uh, the rainfall, the temperature index is a low or high temperature, the duration of the dry season, um, the thermal uh, amplitude, the occurrence of least disease, and all of that will uh, lead to what we call a climate marginality index for rubber trees. And you have an example on the, the map on the right side um, with uh, the baseline today, where can we grow rubber? So the darker the color, uh, the most favorable uh, the zone. So that's for the world. You can have it for country by country. This is uh, the example of Thailand. Uh, this is a, a, a one uh, as an example in Africa, in Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, this is a baseline today. What we are presently doing is to uh, process the data, the predictive data uh, from 2020 up to calendar year 2000, uh, so that we have a good projection of what will be the climate condition in the next uh, decades and how we should adapt and, and, and become more resilient. So how to be resilient uh, is the next question. So what I show you today is a model. Um, and what is important, um, every model is fed with assumptions. And these assumptions are, are, have to be uh, science-based. And particularly for, for the rubber model, what will be important is to understand how the rubber tree will behave when the average annual temperature will go beyond 28 degrees C, uh, which is uh, the known limit today and after, after, after which um, we enter uh, uh, into big question marks about what will be the impact on the yield and the growth of rubber trees. So we need more science on that very parameters. What is true as well, Dr. Aziz was mentioning about um, uh, the IRDB uh, clonal exchange. It will be very important to invest and to develop a, a better genetic material uh, for better tolerance to high, higher temperature water stress and leaf diseases. And what will be important as well is to test uh, the rubber varieties um, in the projected climate conditions, not in the, in the one we are facing today. Uh, as already mentioned as well, um, the yield improvement is absolutely key because um, we, we, we need to get the rubber we need on, a, on, a, on less land. Uh, because uh, the competition to, uh, for, for the access to land will become more and more critical. And the productivity increase is, is also of prior importance and uh, it can be achieved through low frequency tapping uh, as Mr. <coughs> Hagawan was uh, mentioning. We can tap the rubber today once a week and get uh, a similar uh, yield as in D2 or D4. How to achieve it? Uh, through a large dissemination of high performing material, vegetal material, and the, the, the good agricultural uh, practices. At country level, what will be important is to, um, to exercise a proper land use planification, taking into account uh, that predictive climate change model. So that will be important. And last but not least, giving you a, an industry perspective, um, the, the, the more efficient the raw material we use in our tires, the better, because uh, if we can achieve uh, lighter tires, longer lasting tires, it will have a huge impact on the raw mat consumption and the pressure on the use of raw material, natural rubber in particular, uh, will, will, will be lesser. But climate change resilience is very important, but not enough. And as said in the previous presentation as well, uh, our priority um, will be to contribute to uh, the mitigation of climate change impact and also the rubber tree uh, contribute to carbon sequestration. Our value chain also uh, is also emitting uh, CO2 uh, or CO2 equivalent uh, gases. And our priority is to reduce emissions uh, uh, from the very upstream portion of uh, the value chain uh, till uh, the end of the value chain through efficient tires 
or efficient um, rubber shipping. So I will focus on, on the very upstream part uh, related to uh, rubber farming and rubber processing. <clears throat> and I would like to mention that we just developed what we call a, a farm to fob um, a carbon calculator um, following the, the GHG protocol. And that will help uh, have a, uh, an excellent view of where we can act uh, to reduce our emission. So focusing on, on the rubber farming. So today, uh, it depends on the country and the farming system you are using, but you, you can emit up to 600 kilo of uh, a dioxide, a carbon dioxide equivalent per ton of rubber produced. And the, the, the road towards a net zero farming is very much achievable. Um, how to do it uh, with a yield improvement, the higher the, the yield, the lower the carbon footprint. Of course, no deforestation or no negative land use change. Um, a reduced uh, use of a fertilizer, particularly nitrogen fertilizer. How to achieve it with um, um, no tilling, no bare soil, a, a, a smart use of a, a legume cover crop, limit um, the mechanization and um, the, the need for, for transportation. On the processing side, um, today, if you want to produce a ton of uh, uh, natural rubber, your energy consumption will be around two gigajoule per ton of natural rubber uh, through electricity or, or, or LPG. And um, it is highly achievable to reduce uh, that footprint by about 30%. And also to move to cleaner energy, decarbonized energy, because in, in some of uh, the producing country, what we call the emission factor to produce electricity pretty bad and that's a, a very important di direction to, to decarbonize uh, that electricity. Uh, the wastewater treatment is not marginal because uh, it can uh, emit uh, methane also contributing to, uh, to climate change. So I just wanted to share some of um, the directions we could activate uh, to reduce our footprint and the, the carbon calculator which we just developed uh, jointly with some uh, industry partners uh, could become a standard of the industry and help uh, support uh, that uh, important ambition. So basically, uh, that was my message today. Um, uh, the world will need natural rubber, but we need to anticipate changes, uh, climate change impact, and to adapt uh, our practices. So um, uh, thank, thank you again for your attention and uh, well, open to all of your questions. Thank you very much, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Thierry. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, I would say you put 2030 ambition. Uh, 2030 is uh, now very close. <laughs> and uh, I think we need, uh, uh, we need, we need to uh, work hard uh, to, achieve, uh, to achieve those targets. Um, now, um, I would like to open a short Q&A session. So if there is anyone uh, uh, here, um, present here or uh, also online that would like uh, to ask uh, some questions to our speakers. Richard. Yes, hi, it's Richard Lighty here. Uh, P PFC International Southeast Asia Manager for Chiri. Um, I was wondering about the commitment to the sustainable rubber materials. Um, could you give us some more information about how you're defining sustainability and what, what are the current sustainability frameworks that you're using to be able to um, deliver this, this um, very ambitious statement or commitment, I should say? Uh, Thierry, oh. you would like to answer to this? Well, I can start and uh, uh, Salvatore and uh, other people in the room feel free to complete my answer. Uh, first, I would like to say um, uh, that road towards uh, sustainability is not um, uh, 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 the Michelin's one or any individual effort, but it is a collective uh, road we need to all embrace. And uh, we are glad to have uh, the global platform for sustainable natural rubber. Um, which has been incorporated a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2017 or 2018, uh, for all uh, stakeholders in the value chain joining forces 
and um, defining uh, the criteria for sustainability and the main uh, action items to be implemented. So what I wanted to, uh, to show you today uh, is just an angle about um, uh, the impact of climate change we need to anticipate um, and the priority we should be um, uh, giving uh, to um, climate mitigation uh, through the reduction of uh, CO2 emission. So yes, that's really ambitious. That's only one angle. We have a lot of um, other aspects, including a, a social aspect, which I, I just mentioned through the low frequency tapping, for instance. Um, but the global platform uh, is there to, to define um, a common platform um, about uh, what we call sustainability for natural rubber. And um, what I presented today is really uh, one highlight about um, uh, carbon emission reduction. So Salvatore, feel free to, to complete and hope it can uh, answer uh, to, uh, to your question. No, thank you so much. Um, no, I just want to point out anyway, that on this topic of climate change and natural systems, uh, ISG has done a lot of uh, work since uh, June 2020 with uh, C4 FTA and with uh, uh, IRDB uh, and CIRAT as well. So um, there are all, a lot of publications and articles and also we presented two, two papers in this conference. Um, that can be downloaded uh, certainly from the ASG website, uh, they are there. And, um, and these papers have been uh, shared with all the uh, stakeholders in the, in the natural rubber uh, sector. So I think uh, it's uh, very important that uh, the sector actually work together on this, uh, on this topic uh, and share uh, as much information as possible. Uh, I have one question for Dr. Raghavan, a quick one, uh, because he, he, he was mentioning that uh, the sector should uh, promote the green credential of natural rubber and um, any suggestion on how we can do that, uh, Dr. Raghavan, uh, please. Yeah, thank you. No, one would be the uh, impressing upon the respective governments to have some sort of incentive for uh, natural rubber and to a disincentive for the synthetic rubber. This is something which is very uh, important because uh, this should, uh, whatever is the incentive to natural rubber should go into a sort of a fund which would help the growers during the times and the price falls below what is remunerative for them. Uh, the, right now, this is treated only as an industrial raw material. And uh, as per the uh, dictates of the markets, the prices keep fluctuating. Now, but uh, if it's also treated as an important element in the uh, climate change climate uh, change mitigation program, then its uh, relevance becomes much broader than being limited to being a uh, raw, uh, industrial raw material. It is this sort of policy change that is required on that. On the one hand, we need to adopt the elements of traceability to ensure that uh, the practices followed are sustainable. On the other hand, we also need to bring in policy initiatives so that uh, the green credentials get the necessary recognition. And we'll have to take up with the UNCCC also so that the prevailing norms are changed and that uh, it acts in a way to encourage the increased cultivation of uh, natural rubber keeping in mind its green credentials. I hope I satisfy your uh, question or uh, mm -hmm. I've clarified. Thank you, Dr. Raghavan. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, I think now we can close this. Uh... There is, okay. Okay, there is, a, there is a question from James Griffith saying, is the GPSNR linking downstream producers to upstream OEM manufacturers the optimal stakeholder platform to deliver a moderate price for natural rubber to smallholder and mitigate the intensity of climate change? If not, what time, type of platform and programs are required? Uh, I'm not so sure if Thierry wants to answer to this one. Uh, or 
or if Dr. Raghavan want to answer this? I'll just see the question. It is not about really. Let me just check it out and highlight it. Uh, um, this is Thierry speaking. I, I can um, give a try. I see two. I see two questions uh, indeed in uh, in the um, in the flow. One is about um, uh, certification systems, and and the second one by uh, uh, um, James uh, is about um, uh, price for for natural robotus models. So starting with uh, question number one. Um, well, I'm not sure um, certification is the best way um, to achieve uh, sustainability. It's one way for sure. But um, uh, as said before, we have like um, more than 6 million uh, small orders uh, producing natural rubber and, and certification um, might not be able to address uh, the totality of um, the stakeholders. So it could be part of the answer. And um, well, FSC uh, could be uh, could be uh, one answer, but um, if we want to address a, a larger number of people, we could, and that's our policy today, um, start with a risk mapping. So we developed uh, an application for for that, and then after trying to mitigate uh, the risks through capacity building actions. Uh, so that 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 could be um, a way to address uh, the issue with a larger number of people. Um, about pricing, um, I think GPSNR uh, is a platform linking uh, producers, uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, end users, NGOs, uh, civil society. So um, that's a very good place to, um, to, to, to define uh, sustainability uh, criteria. Um, this is not a platform to, uh, to, to discuss about hover pricing today, which is mostly driven uh, by demand and, uh, and, and supply. Um, but um, yes, uh, I, I mean, for sure, uh, we, we need to, um, to, to incentivize uh, the players who are, who are um, uh, playing a very positive role to, to mitigate the intensity of climate change or whatever. But that platform is meant to, um, to mostly define the criteria and uh, adopt a common policy. So maybe you can uh, you can complete my, my answer. Uh, maybe Thierry, we can say yes. Uh, 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 Salvatore, I would just like to add one point on okay. that. Okay. Yeah, uh, GPSNR certainly offers a very important and valuable platform, but uh, to get the message down to the as you said, it's a smallholders crop. When you are linking the smallholders with the manufacturers, the end users, and bringing the other stakeholders in, we should not underestimate the role of the national bodies that can play. Because you can see that the growth, uh, rubber is cultivated in certain countries. It's not cultivated in all countries. There, the national bodies have a very important role in promoting the cultivation of rubber, in channelizing the use of rubber, in identifying the land, and in promoting good agriculture practices. So the national bodies also should be an important stakeholder in the mechanism that links the growers with the end users and the manufacturers. So while GPNR, SNR offers a good platform globally, we should also ensure that there should be similar certification bodies at the national level, which are accredited. Then only will we be able to have a wholesome development in the sector and have a platform which is broad enough to accommodate all sectors. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Raghavan. Uh, your point are very well received. And um, okay, I think now we can move forward uh, on uh, with our uh, panel discussion and uh, and the panelists uh, that are online and uh, here also in Seoul. And uh, uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, Dr. Aziz, uh, Secretary General of IRDB, uh, to make a three minutes uh, statement, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Salvatore. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first, I'd like to mention that, you know, the rubber tree is very unique. Sage and here, uh, Thailand, uh, India, and the, the other countries, around February, March, the leaves turn brown and then drop. And this is important because it can affect microclimate change. Example to quote is central Vietnam. When they started growing rubber, and then with the wintering everything, there is an improvement in number one, the organic matter of the soil. Second, even the microclimate in the area improves. 
So that, that is number one. Number two, I like to emphasize, we are only dealing with heavier Brazilian seas. There are nine other species of rubber, which is untouched. And this is what we are trying to do now. We have carried out expeditions into the Amazon jungle of Brazil, and we are planning one into Peru to collect the heavier species. So provide an opportunity because the focus in the RDB now is breeding, breeding for high yield of both latex, timber, and also disease resistant. So we have to make use of these different species where they provide a very healthy pool of germplasm. And this is one area. And then the other thing, cultivating rubber provides an opportunity for the smallholders. You know, rubber is a very generous crop. The area, if you put the planting distance, you can put in bananas, you can put in sugar cane, papaya, because the, you know, the, the, uh, the age of the plants, by the time they need to tap, it can take six years, seven years in the case of small holding. But if they do practice intercropping, they are likely to visit their holdings more frequently. So the rubber trees will also benefit by this frequent visit. So this is uh, one area of importance where no other crop can provide that sort of intercropping or generosity of the trees to share that piece of land, very limited, uneconomic size of the small holdings, and yet other crops can be put because this will supplement the income of these smallholders. Not many countries provide support for planting materials. Some countries, they do provide assistance. Others, the smallholders have got to do their own, and it's a heavy investment. And then later on, when you tap, when the price is good, you encourage them to actually stimulate the trees. They cannot afford fertilizers. They can't afford the stimulant. So they are, they are stuck in this poverty trap. So I think it is our responsibility, our duty. And I'm very happy that Dr. Raghavan mentioned, sometime when we have this new initiative, we forget that governments invest millions. You know, for example, Sri Lanka is the oldest rubber research institute 1909 it is still in existence and the government is still injecting funds some of the smallholders they are not very happy with the consumers i've got to be very frank here you ask them to do this to do that improve quality it seems to be that never ending but there is no reward for whatever changes they make they produce the best quality the price remains low so this you know you talk about sustainability it is people, planet, price, all these are important. So smallholders are still in the poverty group. So one way of helping them to ensure that in the future, we have people who are still interested to grow this rubber. Otherwise, it will become very, very expensive in the future. So help the smallholders and provide the assistance. For example, the intervention by government mentioned by Dr. Raghavan. In See? Malaysia, there are months that we cannot tap. So government provides some assistance to the smallholders. In terms uh, of the research... Sorry, uh, this, can, you yeah. close? can you close your talk? Okay, I will close by saying that it is the focus on the R&D. You know, three minutes is very short for the RDB to talk about the research and everything. So <laughs> it is important that the consumers also real, realize that you need the material. You cannot continue to have it produced when the price continues to be low. And RD, as far as RDB is concerned, we are working on different planet and also trying to encourage smallholders for value addition. Through their co-op, they should manufacture something. So these are efforts that consumers should come together because you need that raw material. Certainly, quality rubber is needed for, for very good tires. So please work closely with the smallholders. That's good enough for that time being. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aziz. Uh, IRDB have, uh, has done a great job uh, actually over the years and uh, continues to do so. So we certainly collaborate with IRDB to have better clones uh, and uh, better rubber. So but you mentioned Amazon and uh, no, we are very glad to have here uh, a Brazilian expert, uh, Diogo Esperante, that is uh, executive director of APABO. Uh, and Apabor is also an SG industry members. So, so we are very glad to have you here. Uh, Diogo, please. Okay, hello, Salvatore. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I don't know if I can share here my, 
my screen, just a second. Let's see. Uh, okay, here we go. <clears throat> okay, so three minutes. <laughs> uh let's try to do this uh so hello everybody my name is Diogo Esperant I'm executive director of Apabor we are the association of natural rubber producers and processing plants here in Brazil Sao Paulo Brazil um and I'm here today to talk a little bit about uh sustainable natural rubber uh obviously in our perspective um and uh, in three minutes, obviously, I won't be able to give a, a wide scope of the current status and opportunities for that uh, subject, but uh, I will try at least to share uh, some of the opportunities that we are looking in now uh, in our region, and that might serve as an example of a way forward. So. Uh, here in Brazil, basically, uh, we were talking about Amazon, but uh, I am uh, sadly I have to inform you guys that basically we don't produce any uh, more uh, natural rubber in the Amazon as of now. We produce uh, about uh, 100 tons a year, and the uh, national production in Brazil is about 200,000 tons. So basically, we, where we produce all that rubber. Uh, 66 percent, 67 percent in São Paulo, uh, where I'm at, uh, when I'm here, where I am here now, uh, talking to you guys in other neighboring states such as Goiás, Mato Grosso do Sul, uh, Minas Gerais, uh, and other states such as Bahia and Mato Grosso. But uh, in the pre uh, previous, in the uh, last years, have been uh, um, their production. Uh, and what we have as an opportunity uh, in those regions regarding sustainability is that uh, of an impact that it was not caused by rubber production, but by cattle uh, pasture. We have in those regions where we call the Brazilian savanna about 30 million hectares of degraded cattle pasture. Uh, in the main uh, areas where we produce rubber, São Paulo, Mato Grosso do Sul, Minas Gerais, Goiás, we have about 20 million hectares of degraded cattle pasture. Uh, and why I'm uh, uh, saying that that is an opportunity, because, uh, for instance, in São Paulo, where we have 67% of all the production, 80% of all processing plants, 90% of all industrial consumption, uh, we've been planting natural rubber basically upon those uh, areas of degraded cattle pasture. And there is a legislation uh, in Brazil uh, that also uh, obligates uh, producers to have 20% of their land into natural forests. And uh, there is this opportunity of in the cropping natural rubber with natural forests within those regions. So. If we take alone the uh, 133,000 hectares that we have of rubber in Sao Paulo, and we uh, would add uh, another 20% uh, of uh, what we call reservas legais with uh, inner cropping of natural forest with natural rubber, then uh, we would have an additional 26,000 hectares of natural rubber inner cropped with natural forests. Uh, and obviously bringing all uh, benefits, uh, sus uh, sus sustainable benefits, uh, not only environmental, but obviously uh, economical and social because we would be benefiting the local communities with it. So this is uh, one of the opportunities that we're looking at. Uh, our, our action plan right now with this is we are creating common funds of interested agents within our uh, rubber industry to help finance these investments. Uh, there are already uh, some companies and, and interesting to say, not only companies re related to rubber industry, but companies in other sectors that are looking into and are interested in financing uh, planting forests uh, intercropped with natural rubber here in the region. Uh, so this is uh, just a small portion of uh, some of the things that we're doing right here and that I wanted to share with you guys. So thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Diogo. Thank you very much for, for this uh, introduction to, uh, to Brazil and Natural Lab in Brazil. Uh, now I would uh, like to ask uh, uh, Diane uh, Sukumaja, uh, Senior Officer of Forestry uh, in the Asian uh, Secretariat, uh, to provide uh, his presentation. Diane? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you to the organizer for inviting the ASEAN Secretariat to this very important uh, event during, uh, in conjunction with World Forestry Congress. I just would like to briefly uh, present the overview of natural rubble dialogue in ASEAN, uh, touch upon on the, the brief figures on natural rubber in the region. Uh, I think you may already know that uh, traded value of natural rubber in ASEAN, uh, ASEAN to global in 2018 has reached recorded to 12 billion, million, billion US dollar, and it was decreased into 11 billion US dollar in 2020. Perhaps, uh, perhaps not not sure very much, but perhaps due to the COVID pandemic 19. And the export value, value for, from ASEAN to, to the global in 2020 recorded to 9 billion US dollar. Uh, however, it, is, uh, it was decreased uh, from 10, about 11 billion US dollar in 2018, which is 18%. And you also may be uh, aware than me that Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam is uh, the main producer of natural rubber, contributed larger trading in the region as well as globally. And uh, natural rubber, uh, looking at those numbers, has been um, an important commodity actually for the region and supporting the economic growth of uh, ASEAN member state. Uh, just briefly, uh, under our cooperation in agriculture and forestry, uh, we have uh, main sectors addressing issues related to the crops, livestock, fisheries, and forestry. But unfortunately, at the moment has yet discussed matters related to rubber or natural rubber under our sectors. Although uh, I think it is surprisingly, although our ASEAN member state actually traded the natural rubber, including Singapore and nine ASEAN member states produce natural rubber, but it was uh, it is yet discussed uh, at the regional level. I just would like to in, in, inform that under ASEAN economic ministers, we have the ASEAN Consultative Committee on Standard and Quality and a rubber-based product working group that uh, oversee the development and implementation of mutual recognition arrangement and harmonized regulatory reg regimes related to the nature, related to the rubber overall, and also uh, to identify standard for rubber and nature-based uh, product for ASEAN to harmonize with international standard and quality. Uh, the ASEAN under the ACCSQ also has developed the ASEAN framework on rubber, rubber laboratory network. This is just to uh, maintain and also ensure that the quality of uh, rubber from, from this region is uh, the best and also following the international standard. As I also learned from the previous speaker, uh, there are some issues related to the natural rubber development in the region, including uh, uh, the Dr. Ragavan also mentioned about smallholders, uh, how the policies can support smallholders natural rubber production, and also how they can access to financing mechanism. The second is, of course, sustainability of natural rubber production, policy and tenure issues, always uh, the uh, challenge for this uh, natural rubber development. And then in terms of technical low seedling qualities and regeneration uh, as mentioned by Dr. Abdul Aziz as well, I think uh, smallholders need support for the best clone uh, to be planted in this uh, region. And then also uh, in terms of sustainability, maintaining sustainability resources, uh, still lack management skill for, for the smallholders. And then of course, climate change. Uh, Climate change impact has reduced uh, the production and also might, might also cause pests and diseases outbreak. How the region uh, could promote green economy growth in natural rubber system? I just would like to echo previous uh, speakers that uh, the natural rubber could improve livelihood of community living surrounding the forest and create job opportunity. 
although the uh, has yet intensively discussed at ASEAN, natural rubber has been an important commodity for the region and supporting its economic growth. And therefore, there are some uh, potential window uh, to promote sustainable agriculture in enhancing natural rubber production sustainable, sustainably, and then encourage agroforestry practices in rubber plantation by mixing crops and the other uh, rubbers and other food crops, uh, while also man maintaining biodiversity and ensuring people livelihood and also, of course, maintain soil fertility. And there is also the need uh, to create favorable policies and regulation to support sustainability of natural rubber and ensure land tenure security, promote private sector engagement and support capacity building also one of the important uh, areas. Last but not least, at present, ASEAN is moving forward to promote sustainable agriculture and circularity, promote nature-based solution and decarbonization efforts, as well as carbon neutrality. And it is important to linkage those set of priorities in the region with sustainable natural rubber system. As potential windows uh, for further discussion later, uh, there is kind of platform, available platform to promote dialogue on natural rubber, including the working group on social forestry. As Dr. Robert Nasi mentioned, rubber is considered also a non timber forest product. I think through the working group on social forestry, we can further discuss uh, this natural rubber system or mechanism. The second one is working group on forest product development. It is uh, perhaps related to the utilization of rubber wood. Uh, with that, uh, I conclude with my presentation and thank you, uh, Dr. Salvatore. Back to you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, introduction to the work that uh, the Asian Secretariat is doing also on rubber. Mm -hmm. Uh, now I would like to ask uh, the first speaker in presence here, and that is uh, Richard Leity, uh, that we have seen before. Uh, he's Southeast Asia manager from PEFC. Richard. Thank you, and I hope I can put some slides up. I actually have a, a um, in-person interactive tool, but um, if my slides could be put up, I would like to just introduce about developing successful partnerships for quality infrastructure in ASEAN and how the, we promote the green economy in natural rubber. And so I, I first would like to comment a little bit about what some of the previous speakers have said about GPSNI as being an inclusive platform. It, it, it doesn't allow governments and associations to be members of their platform, voting members. And so I like I would like to follow up the um, colleague from India's response that we need to include national approaches. And that Michelin also mentions FSC as a certification system. And this is impossible for some companies like in Vietnam, which is now excluding all of the smallholders from Vietnam, or at least 70% of the smallholders from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos to access markets. So these sorts of policies, we need to think about what is equitable in the rubber uh, sector. So I would like to show that PFC has grown in Southeast Asia with Thailand and Vietnam becoming members. We now have more than 60,000 tons of certified rubber on, in the market, going to Germany, going into electric cars. And we have about 200,000 hectares of rubber wood that is being used by the local furniture market in Vietnam. And we are working with the national standards in Thailand and we have full support from the government and the, which is a critical part of um, an enabling sustainable rubber. So next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I'd like to introduce this idea of building more confidence between the tree owners and the standard owners. And this is about our projects that we have, where we ha have support from PFC membership. Um, of, we have 330 million hectares certified around the world. We, there's no reason why we cannot include the 11 million hectares of rubber. And so we are doing pilot projects. We are supporting quality infrastructure. So auditors, certification bodies and accreditation bodies to be able to include smallholders into the certification. And we are having these conversations at the ASEAN level. And I am very happy that Dian was here and he's mentioned some of the bodies that we've been working at and a project that we have at ASEAN 
that can include rubber to be able to be um, part of the green economy that these companies and the, 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 the stakeholders are asking. Next, please. So we have spent five years developing this in these forums in the Asia Pacific Forestry Week and building on the Pan-ASEAN Timber Certification Initiative, we have worked with the ASEAN Senior Officials of Forestry and we have worked with the ASEAN Consultative Committee of Standards and Quality, which already have the rubber-based working groups. These government-run processes should not be excluded from these sustainability platforms. And so we are taking it in, in, on ourselves to develop the um, a, a project that is led by Vietnam. We have been supported by UN Red and we have mobilized it at the Lower Mekong region. Now we have the project approved at ASEAN and I would ask you to get your QR code scanner out and, um, and be ready to give some feedback for the next slide, please. Um, that we would like, if you can, to scan this code next because we want to implement this project and it's it's a it's a two million to ten million dollar project that is needed to support the the CLM countries of ASEAN. And once we do ASEAN, we can move to the APEC level. And this is the bottom up approach that PFC uses, um, which includes the use the cooperation with governments, research institutions, and the associations, which have been working for rubber to and the, the rubber farmers for the last one hundred years. And so PFC certification can help demonstrate the sustainable production. For example, the Vietnamese companies have been a case study for the ASEAN responsible investments of agriculture. And it can, PFC can also be a way for the customers such as Michelin to be able to come and see the production and see what are our standards, what, are our, what is the certification system and being able to build confidence in a bottom-up approach to be able to address issues that the smallholders are facing and make sure that we can include them and not exclude them. And so that is my three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, now uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Moisi, uh, Moisi Tor of uh, uh, Southeast Asia, Deputy Regional Director of ProForest, uh, to provide this uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for the organizer uh, inviting uh, ProForest to uh, be part of this uh, the event, the site events, um, in conjunction with the World Forestry Congress in Seoul, Korea. So it's my pleasure actually to share a few slides with you, very quick one. I hope you all can see it. Yeah, let me put it into a PowerPoint mode. Yeah, um, as a mission-driven organization, ProForest has been helping, um, I would say that all the private companies as well as stakeholder in supporting the transition to the agricultural commodities uh, production and sourcing uh, that deliver positive um, social and environmental outcomes to, for people and the planets. So in our work with all the stakeholders, we always deploy our theory of change, which is here that to share with you about how we work within the supply chain and beyond the supply chain. I think according to some of the speakers that mentioned the point, uh, I think share with you, probably is fall under these two important components. Because as we know, for individual uh, private companies like Michelin and some other uh, private companies, um, they have to work with their suppliers regularly in order to collaborate and deliver their social and uh, environmental co uh, commitments. Uh, at all the volumes that they produce or buy, and then to work with their suppliers in the end uh, to achieve the commitments that include the entire uh, supply chain actors. 
I mean, of course, there will be some systemic issue, uh, systemic, uh, systemic issues that couldn't be addressed. Hence, why is that we promote actually um, the stakeholder and the companies to work uh, beyond their supply chain through the landscape collaboration or sectoral, uh, co I mean, initiative uh, out there um, to actually address uh, all these social and environmental issues that involve um, a series of thing, um, different actors that. Uh, fall within the same landscape or sector-wise approach. Well, in ProForest, we do the plot. Uh, we also have our Icarus approach, learning from uh, our experience through uh, working with various uh, agricultural commodities such as palm oil, uh, sugar, soy, and some others. So throughout that whole journey, we learn actually uh, in order to achieve, I think, um, your own no deforestation or human rights, uh, respect human rights commitments, you need to start with a, a, a systematic approach. From here, that actually we, we uh, the company or a, a entity could start with having a strategy or policy commitment in place. And this included, uh, you must have an action plan or implementation to guide you along that journey. And then throughout that, um, before you, you, I mean, after you have such commitment, then it's really important for you to understand your own supply base. So hence why is that um, or companies talk about uh, understanding uh, through the traceability uh, um, mechanism or even uh, risk analysis they have in place. I mean, in order to understand uh, and prioritize the next intervention with the suppliers and beyond uh, the supply chain as well. And then obviously engagement is, is, is key here. Therefore, engagement within and beyond supply chain could actually bring a meaningful intervention to all the players that involve. And finally, not forget to mention the monitoring and reporting, which is also important to report your progress and demonstrate your commitments from time to time and achieve your milestone accordingly. So based on our experience, uh, at this point of time, we observe there are some uh, sustainability trends or movement that happening around the whole, um, I would say, rubber sectors. So from the strategy or policy wise that uh, we learned, there are many companies now put uh, in place their own no deforestation and respect human rights commitment. And uh, then after that, uh, also carry out um, different, I think, traceability exercise and risk analysis or assessment within the supply chain. And through that, actually prioritize the suppliers, especially tier one suppliers they need to engage with. And then this is also important to provide capacity building for the smallholder and uh, small medium enterprises to the uh, responsible sourcing uh, for smallholder framework or some other framework in place. And I wanted, would like to echo to uh, some of the points bring up by the formal speakers. I think almost everyone that say smallholder is very important in this sector. Hence why is that we couldn't actually ignore them and have to work with them closely moving forward. And beyond than that, uh, of course, we are looking at um, um, involving in, in jurisdictional or landscape approach or even uh, promote company collaboration moving forward. And then finally, it's about, again, monitoring and reporting. We know that there are many different mechanisms out there that could be actually uh, deployed by, by or adopted by, by the companies altogether. Thank you. That's my sharing. Thank you so much. Um... Of course, now in uh, rub, not all rubber, you have some issues uh, clearly, but uh, uh, I think um, no one of these issues could be solved if we don't get finance, right? Uh, or some finance to, to do that. Uh, so I would like to, to invite uh, Ben Vickers, Land Use Forest and uh, Ecosystems Senior Specialist uh, at the Green Climate Fund uh, to provide his presentation, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I am by no means a rubber expert, um, and uh, I, I can basically try and build on what's been said already, uh, and try and draw out what what I feel may be relevant um, from the GCF perspective. Um, we we are of course the GCF. We have a mandate to try to provide a, a balance in climate finance between adaptation and mitigation objectives. We also have. Uh, um, the aim to 
uh, to scale up significantly over the coming years, the proportion of the support that we provide or the funds that we disperse to the private sector. Uh, so with this in mind, um, one of the things I think I'd like to highlight, which I'm not sure we've really touched on so far, is is the is the emergence of the, the zero deforestation um, policies from the supply side and the uh, in in the Western world in particular. Um, rubber is now considered one of the well, six land intensive commodities identified as a potential driver of forest loss, and in the emerging policy environment. Um, in the UK, it's uh, been identified in the draft environmental law as one of the potential commodities that will be focused on, um, as well as in the US, um, the Draft Forest Act, which is uh, aimed at pr uh, uh, promoting sustainable uh, um, commodity imports to, to the US. At the moment, it's not named in the draft EU deforestation regulation, but this remains something that might happen in the future. So looking at this emerging policy environment, there is a very strong signal from the supply side that um, the production of quantities like rubber um, will need to adapt. And uh, it's clear that from past experience, for example, with, uh, with the timber sector, with the flag tea, the producer countries that are um, intended to provide this uh, more sustainable supply chain to say the EU, UK and US are going to need support to adapt their supply chains to these new market standards. Um, or whatever policies that uh, the, the consumer countries develop will, will not be implementable. Um, we see at the moment uh, that there's approximately, I found a 2.7% per annum growth in rubber consumption globally. Uh, currently, there's no sign of that slowing. Um, so in particular, the, in Asia, with Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, China, Vietnam, Philippines being the top seven rubber producer countries, as far as I could find out, this is going to be um, a real challenge. How are we going to keep that supply going and this increased demand, to meet the increased demand with these new challenging standards and policy environment? So we see at GCF, we certainly see opportunities to direct finance uh, to produce the countries to provide the institutional and governance environment uh, and to enable the rubber industry and domestic uh, um, rubber industries to to contribute to these global mitigation objectives that the supplier that the consumer countries are driving um, but we also of course see the the need uh, as was pointed out by previous speakers for uh, the domestic rubber industries to adapt to the climate situation. So the CIRAD um, research that was noted that there is going to be some need for the rubber plantations themselves to adapt to changing precipitation in temperature, uh, exposure to new diseases, drops in productivity. Um, so there is a need for finance to be directed to producer countries to help the rubber industry to adapt to this, become more resilient. To, to this new climate reality. Um, what I also would, would like to, to echo what other speakers have said is the importance of smallholders in this sector. It's clear that, that um, many, many, uh, um, uh, a high proportion, on, particularly in Thailand and in Indonesia, uh, of the rubber production is dependent on smallholders, uh, family businesses, a lot of the employment that is uh, dependent on the rubber sector is informal, but I couldn't really find, maybe other speakers have these figures, any firm figures at national or international level on the employment, on the number of, on the amount of labor that is dependent on the rubber sector for livelihoods. When we're looking at adaptation objectives, this is absolutely crucial. Um, so we would like to see some more information from the rubber sector, from the stakeholders here about what is the employment situation, how it's likely to be affected in the coming years. Um, very uh, encouraging to see the emergence of the GPSNR uh, as, as a global platform for, um, for promoting sustainability in the rubber sector. Um, Michelin is one of the companies that is aiming uh, for, for in increasing the proportion of its uh, um, um, supply 
to be derived from the sustainable sources. But we would certainly see from GCF side uh, a need to work with the private sector and the rubber industry in particular to accelerate the, uh, um, these aims and speed up the rate at which rubber uh, consumers are, are able to, uh, to meet the 100% uh, goal of sustainable sourcing um, in, in over the next decades. So there's, um, yeah, there, there's certainly a, a large potential uh, for, for, um, for work for, from the GCF side, at least, to, to work with the rubber sector and to, uh, uh, to, to work towards the, the increased contribution of the rubber sector towards both mitigation and adaptation goals. Uh, and we would welcome uh, innovative proposals from, from both private and public side to help us do that. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Uh, very interesting uh, talk, I think. Uh, you touched a few points that are very important. Uh, one of which is uh, the lack of information, for instance. Uh, I think the sector should do more, um, on, especially on the social, on the social side. Uh, now, um, I would like to, there should be a, a recorded a short presentation from uh, Emily Gallagher. Uh, she's an integrated uh, rural development specialist C4. Uh, she will speak about uh, gender equality and the role of women in the rubber sector. Good afternoon, my name is Emily Gallagher. I am a scientist for the Sustainable Value Chains and Investment Team with C4 eCraft in Nairobi, Kenya. I have been asked to speak about gender and social inclusion to promote resilience and economic growth in the rubber industry. More specifically, how can we address barriers for more equitable and inclusive value chains for sustainable rubber, especially in relation to women? Although we know that rubber production is a male-dominated industry, we also know that women are active in rubber value chains and that there are different gendered norms between and even within countries. In some places, female labor is recognized and valued, and in other places, it is invisible and oftentimes uncompensated. It is true that companies and CSOs are disrupting some of these gendered barriers in an effort to promote social inclusion and that the International Rubber Study Group proposed steps to address inequality in the rubber value chain even pre-COVID in 2019. And yet more recent studies still show similar patterns. To answer the question about equity and social inclusion, we really have to address the different barriers for hired labor on estates and at the processing node, separate from smallholder production systems. The rubber industry has played a significant role in providing rural employment to men and women, including youth, and has made progress in some countries in building the capacities of women to take on tasks traditionally coded as male jobs through targeted skills training and human capital development. So in some cases, women form the bulk of the labor force, uh, for example, in budding, um, but are not well represented as tappers, while in many Asian cases, uh, women tappers are normalized. Companies which recognize and promote women publicly are working to transform gender norms. However, this only transfers the labor if it is not also accompanied by economic empowerment to transform gender norms around female control over income, decision-making capacity, and leadership. So with regards to safety and security, the industry can lead the way in developing social safeguards, sexual harassment policies, occupational health and safety standards, especially for pregnant women and nursing mothers. And where this happens, this has improved social acceptability of women working outside the home. Yet we still see that women need additional support to take on decision-making roles, to speak out, especially in cultural contexts where women are not active in the public sphere. This can come through promoting women to supervisory roles, creating women's committees and public programs, and having gender affirmative policies to have women represented at all levels. And when it comes to smallholder producers, there are additional barriers having to do with land and resource tenure and access to working capital to invest in the rubber farming system. 
The rubber industry can transform gender norms through capacity and skills building, recognizing female labor in the supply chain, promoting women's leadership opportunities, and economic empowerment through direct payment to women farmers. Where family farms are registered as part of outgrower schemes or farmers associations, it is necessary to render the invisible female labor visible by registering women and ensuring that they are represented in decision-making spaces pursuing alternatives to land titles to allow female farmers to participate in outgrower schemes, and where possible, working with the development sector to provide gender-specific programming, financial literacy, and leadership training. So in answer to the question, equity and inclusion requires some investment in gender responsive, responsive strategies to build women's capacity to engage and men's acceptance of the shifting responsibilities. Thank you for listening, and thank you to our donor, the European Commission, and to our research partner in Ghana. And thank you to Emily for her presentation. And uh, uh, last presentation is from uh, Dr. Lakshmi Nair. She is uh, the head uh, of economics and statistics of uh, ISG. Uh, Lakshmi, three minutes, three, please. Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. My former speakers as well as panelists. Lakshmi, can you put the presentation full screen, please? Okay, sorry about that. I'm echoing with the, my previous speakers and fellow panelists those who have pointed out on very challenging aspects of natural rubber and also the potential opportunity for natural rubber for greening the economy. Just to point out some basic facts before going into the work that IRSG Secretariat has done for climate change adaptation and mitigation specific to natural rubber. About 30 million tons produced globally, natural rubber is a key strategic material used in inducer application ranging from toys, health care, mobility, construction, and aerospace. Many speakers previously mentioned that the importance of natural rubber being a naturally derived elastomer and the key importance of this raw material for um, greening the economy. Around 40% of the global rubber consumption is coming from natural sources. And geographically, both production and usage of natural rubber is concentrated in Asia Pacific region. The supply chain of natural rubber with the more than 30 million US dollar has a key role to play in both adaptation and mitigation of climate change. As an important land user, it's already mentioned by Mosi and uh, uh, Richard Lachty, uh, as a producer of renewable raw, raw material, and of course, as a major economic activity, as the, this supply chain depends on more than millions of, more than six millions of small growers who produce rubber and under challenging economic, social, and environmental condition. IRSC has, work in collaboration with um, C4, IRDB, and CIRAD for organizing a climate change workshop and Secretariat has produced a policy paper addressing the climate change impact of natural rubber and how natural rubber can quickly adapt to those changes. We have seen that climate change is already impacting the rubber production science-based climate actions with the right policy tools, global production can be safeguarded and sustainably increased on a lasting basis under climate change while contributing to climate mitigation goals. Focusing on the, the main aspect, the net zero transition in the natural rubber sector. The net zero transition is so important as it is the path 
to limit global temperature rises and to stave off the worst impact of the climate change. The global pandemic and the supply chain disruption provided both challenges, but also at the same time, it's provided opportunities for CO2 emission reduction in the supply chain of mobility, the main inducer of rubber. Major business, economic and societal shift towards sustainable production and consumption, embracing the circular economy underlines the transition to 1.0 degree pathways. Effective uptake of sustainability, if you look at the rubber industry landscape, as previous um, speakers has rightly pointed out, both from an ecosystem health point of view, as well as from the socioeconomic benefit, which is to be included of uh, small farmers, as well as small and medium enterprises. Demand-driven supply risk is limited. More action is required by companies focusing on restructuring their portfolios and actually reducing the emission in their extended supply chain. Governments and business need to act now with urgent, urgency and resolve and to take a system-wide approach. And to do that, we need collaboration and work, working across both public and private sector. Spending on energy and land use system, as echoing with the previous speakers, need to increase substantially and finance is needed to extend support for many of the value chain players to achieve net zero. Any assessment of GST emission of the end users supply chain under scope three should be done not in silos as PFCs has rightly pointed out that both the supply chain uh, responsible sourcing within the system and outside the system, a holistic approach on emission reduction of all raw material used in the end user application should be considered. So what are the action points we have discussed and concluded from the study we have undertaken and the result of the workshop we have done? the net zero em emission pathways or a transition towards green economy. Of course, the climate action need to be grounded on science as Dr. Aziz has rightly pointed out on, on very elements of that and Dr. Raghavan also mentioned on that. But that climate adaptive, resilient and inclusive pathways for promoting the green economy, especially on the inclusive pathway, this, many speakers rightly quote, on the small grower inclusive approach that the system has to adopt, whether it is top, top down approach or bottom up approach, what is to be adopted? As Dr. Raghavan mentioned, okay, this is to have an inclusive approach of the region and the countries. Yes, it's a, the approach to be a bottom up approach, but to move that bottom up approach to adapt well to what the global requirement are to reach the net zero, so some level of harmonization need to be there from the, from the country level approach to the global level approach. So to adopt to those changes, of course, what it is key is data. So climate scenario analytics of the countries or the regions or the uh, companies, this is very much important for uh, countries as well as company to adopt policies aiming for net zero. Yes, uh, Mr. Teresides has mentioned on uh, coming up with a CO2 calculation metrics. Of course, that is important, but at the same time, traceability in the supply chain with the digitalization and with the needed support um, capacity building programs and the much needed finance is equally important to have an inclusive resilient pathway for a green economy. So integrated approach is a requirement for um, borer sustainability dimension. It is not really natural rubber, other raw material which is going into the different application of the end users need to be taken into account. And the bioeconomy and the circular economy aspects is an integral part of aiming the net zero transition for natural rubber and the rubber economy, which we could attain only through collaboration. A holistic approach is needed with both producers and consumers, the government, civil society, and all the players 
need to be in place to attain a sustainable development, which certainly it is inclusive and green, addressing the many challenges now we are facing the pandemic and supply chain disruption and um, many from a sustainable development point of view. So sustainable development of the river economy, mostly go all the panelist speakers, various dimension pointed out, but whether it is to be brought in from the perspective of a certification or it is only a visibility checking of what all action is going on in the supply chain of various raw material. But of course, what the, the sector as a whole to be addressed is a holistic approach addressing all these elements to attain a sustainable development for the rubber economy. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi. And uh, we are already over time, I think, and uh, we need uh, to close very quickly. I just want to ask uh, Vincent Gitz if uh, he wants uh, to say a few words, uh, um, and then uh, we can conclude uh, this uh, event. Uh, from here, perhaps, yes, perhaps better. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salvatore. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry we, can, we don't have time for, for questions, but that just shows the, the richness of, of the perspective that um, uh, we managed to gather. I really thank all the presenters uh, for, for the, the very rich presentations. I think uh, when we started to work with a bit closer with IRSG a few, a few years ago, uh, it was also based on the, from a research perspective, for development perspective, on the, the kind of the feeling that the rubber sector was underplayed in, in sustainable development and in climate. And, and it was, in fact, a critical sector in the way that it brings really all the dimensions together from uh, uh, economic, social, environmental. And, and, and we talk about that all the time, but in rubber, we, we really see that it is a critical um, and a, a very special characteristic of the sector, and also looking at the, the role between intersection between value chain, driving change through value chains, and then driving change through land, land landscape, land use approaches, and all these, these two needs to interact. So what, what we see is it's emblematic for the green economy, and it's emblematic for sustainable development, but uh, it it makes it a bit more difficult as well because it really requires coordinated action of, of a broad range of actors, as many have said today. I will not cite all these actors again, but the idea is that there is, I think, a willingness to, to do things and a willingness to attract other actors that are perhaps less currently less connected, uh, climate change actors, finance, sustainable uh, development, sustainable landscape finance sectors, and so on, to um, the, the, the transformational need of the, of the rubber sector. And I would see, based on the exchanges today, three, three critical pathways for transformation. First, we need to share knowledge, uh, gather it and share it, and, and, in, and indeed raise the visibility uh, of, of natural rubber as a component of green growth to other sector. And that's why we, we're bringing to the attention of the climate change community. We're really glad to talk now with the Green Climate Fund. Uh, because there are real needs in countries and we really need to, to show that, in fact, rubber is a solution to, to some of, of the broad objectives. Then we need to put a, in place an enabling environment, not leaving the sector alone. I think there is a strong enabling environment already in place, but we need some mechanisms to, to enable sustainable practices and facilitate their recognitions. Uh, by all actors. And we know that even certification is a bit of, a, of also a challenge there. Is there always a price primer to certification and so on? Uh, we need to make finance uh, and, and sustainable development finance work for the sector. I think APABOR has mentioned that. Uh, and and, and uh, we have here an opportunity, as I think Ben, because I said, because of the, the importance of, of making bonds between adaptation and mitigations and, um, and the fact that the that climate actions now is linked to sustainable development. The Paris Agreement has really recognized that this is a fundamental component and smallholder um, based rubber, rubber system is basically an emblematic way to, to, to do sustainable development and social issues at the same time that you're doing climate action. And then the third pathway is really invest in research upstream and downstream. Upstream because 
uh, Robert Nazir said at the beginning, rubber is, rubber is close to forest or the closest to forest, but it's also in a way the closest to agriculture and farming uh, because of the potential for rubber agroforestry systems and so on. Uh, and we really have here perhaps even all the research to revitalize and, 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 and invest in. And IRDB has been, of course, fundamental into, into, into this. So far, there is probably an increased role for them even in the future. Um, downstream, new uses, uh, uh, new uses, adding values that will maybe also help solving a little bit the price problem. Because if you add new uses, you add value, you may reduce price volatility. So in the future, when we look at our relation and building on what we've done with IR, IRSG, IRDB, uh, CIHAD in the framework of the, the FTA uh, research program that we're now in fact bringing to a new um, moment because we yesterday launched the new FTA partnership. We really want to help the, all the, this community of actors. I think we've talked, the, the GPSNR has been mentioned, it, maybe it lacks a little bit or we, we need to develop in a way of a form of a knowledge partnership as well to bring the knowledge component a bit more strongly into this platform and if in fact help also IRSG as the main uh, as the main uh, and major uh, institution that brings all these actors together uh, to develop in fact the pathways for the future we have the idea of a guide uh, that needs to of to to help these actors to for the system development of rubber um, it will need to be co-constructed so that's an invitation to follow up on these discussions to to make that uh, um, a reality in the framework of the new FTA partnership in which IRSG is associated with C4, CIHAD and, and many others. Thank you, Salvatore. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, from my side, I just uh, would like to say, you know, uh, partnership uh, that uh, Vincent uh, was mentioned before are uh, extremely important uh, between organizations that have one goal and the goal here is to to make uh, this natural rubber uh, sustainable because it's a strategic raw material. We need the natural rubber today. We will need uh, in the future for sure. So uh, it's very important that we all collaborate and uh, uh, with, and in this collaboration, of course, the finance side has to, has to be in there. The producing uh, countries and governments has to be part of this, uh, of the ac active part of these discussions. And uh, we need really uh, to do a great work uh, for uh, providing also to smallholders uh, an income that allow them uh, to have a reasonable in, uh, living and also be able to uh, implement sustainable uh, agriculture practice, practices in their own uh, plantations. So I would like to thank everyone, all the speakers that uh, have been here, uh, the speakers online. Uh, we had, uh, I think, 42 um, uh, attendants uh, online as well. So I think it was a great uh, success from my side. And uh, I would like to thank everyone once again. Thank you so much.